Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video we're going to be talking about Ultima Thule because it's been a few months since the original flyby and since then approximately 10% of all of the data that was captured during the mission was already processed and so we have some new information about this really cool looking object. So let's discuss this and welcome to What The Math. And so this right here is the Ultima Thule Explorer. This is the New Horizons probe that also obviously visited Pluto and became the first object to visit such a faraway body in our solar system. And the most recent scientific publication about this particular mission is actually from 200 different scientists from 40 different organizations around the world. And it's sort of a culmination of all of these studies all together on what we've learned about this strange and enigmatic object known as 2014 MU69, also known as Ultima Thule. So first of all, we've discovered that it does have these unusual bright spots that can be seen from different locations um, around the object, and specifically in the lower regions of the um, two objects, Ultima and Thule. These bright objects are most likely uh, different types of reflective ices, even potentially water ice that has also been discovered, that slowly rolled downhill and settled in these crevices around the um, Ultima Thule. Specifically, there's a lot of them right here in this so-called neck between these two objects. We also confirmed uh, that these objects represent what's known as a contact binary. And this image right here briefly shows what happens with these objects. So first, uh, a typical binary is created from various rocks and various dust around the system. Then the two start orbiting around one another and most likely are actually tidally locked toward each other. Basically, they're always facing each other kind of like these two objects right here, this is Pluto and its partner Charon. Charon being the closest object to us right now. And here, if I were to accelerate time a little bit, you'll see that they're kind of always facing each other. They're never really showing each other the other side. Um, kind of like our moon toward Earth. Even though um, only the moon is tidally locked, the Earth is not tidally locked to the moon. So these um, objects may also one day become very similar to Ultima Thule, we are not really sure yet. But the last step here is for these two slightly different size objects to come closer together. And this can be either done by losing some of the other moons, which transfers momentum and thus decreases overall speed, or maybe there was just a lot of dust in the system, so they eventually lost their orbit, came really close together and literally combined into one single body, forming Ultima Thule. Now we believe this collision was very slow, possibly something like maybe even less than one meter per second, or basically just a few kilometers or miles per hour. And um, it was just a gentle touchdown. And this resulted in what we're seeing right here. So this is the recent understanding of what's happened in this system. And we also realized that this happened a long time ago. This was something like 4 billion years ago when the solar system was just being created. And since then, the uh, paper suggests that nothing really happened to this object. It was literally kind of like left alone entirely by itself, orbiting at these really far away reaches of space. And um, we believe that it's essentially like the primordial image of the solar system. Um, in other words, it's what used to be all over the place, and because it's so far away and hasn't really received many collisions or interacted with a lot of materials, it sort of is like the preserved history of the solar system. So one day it would be really nice to visit to see what we discover here. We also found out that um, even though it does look kind of um, as if it had a lot of craters on the surface, and I think this image here shows it a little bit better, the actual craters um, are not really craters. As a matter of fact, there are only two impact craters on the entire surface, with the other protrusions being um, the result of evaporation of different elements. In other words, the ices that were all over the surface eventually evaporated, releasing um, material as gas, and um, left these holes in the actual surface. But there are still at least two impact craters we've detected that were the result of a relatively slow collision with another object. Also, um, one more really important fact here is that 
we've officially confirmed that this is the most red object we've ever visited. So even though some of the original images made it look kind of like this, um, it was most likely just black and white, eventually the analysis suggested that it's actually extremely red, the reddest uh, object we have ever been to. And this is the result of the so-called tholins, about which I've talked about in the video, somewhere right there. So tholins are actually formed by um, sunlight. And here, even though this object receives something like 1 900th of the sunlight we get here on Earth, um, it was still enough to slowly transform all of these materials into these red-looking, slimy, tar-like um, formations. So the tholins make it red, but at the same time, what's interesting is that it's too cold for any other chemical reactions to occur. So in every other sense, it's completely untouched by anything. The only reactions that happen here are due to the solar radiation, but because it's so cold, there's nothing else that's changed. So in other words, once again, it's literally a primordial object from early history. It's also um, exceptionally dark in a sense that it doesn't reflect very uh, much of light. It only reflects about 12% of all of the light, and that's about three or almost four times less than our planet Earth. So in other words, it's sort of like um, dirt in, in terms of the actual reflectivity. But as I mentioned, there are unusual reflective areas in certain low locations, like this right here, the neck, that do reflect a little bit more light than the other parts of this strange body. And another really strange thing about Ultima Thule is that, um, let's just try to accelerate time here a little bit, um, the actual spin of the object is relatively slow, and this is actually um, why a lot of areas here don't really get to see a lot of sunlight. So here we're spinning um, several hours per second. As a matter of fact, uh, some areas don't experience any sunlight for decades, and because of that they're in complete darkness for a very long time, and then some other areas are always in the sunlight. Then, as it orbits around the sun, it takes it about 293 years to orbit once, um, it sort of flips over, and this results in uh, the areas that used to be bright now being dark, and areas that used to be dark now being bright. So it's a very strange orbital pattern. And the last major discovery um, as of 2019 is that, well, it's actually the lack of discovery of any kind of moons or any kind of rings in the system. And this is explained simply because of the whole collision thing. Before these two objects collided with each other, they probably had a lot of rings and a lot of um, different objects orbiting around them, but they slowly kicked them out, taking away their momentum, and thus losing speed. And because of this, they were able to collide together. So, like I said, it's possible that something like this may happen to Pluto and Charon one day, and maybe has happened to other objects, but for the most part, this is the only one we've discovered so far that is a confirmed former binary object that collided forming a single object and also kicked out everything else from its orbital vicinity. In other words, unlike Pluto that has five different moons in a relatively stable orbit, at least for now, the Ultima Thule doesn't have anything anymore. It's all by itself, but it's a combination of a, at least two different objects. So anyway, so that's kind of what we've learned as of May of 2019, but remember, this is only 10% of all of the data we've been able to collect. In the next few years, and specifically by uh, mid-2020, we should have the rest of the data finally transferred from the New Horizons mission, and because of the distances involved, this transfer is just really, really slow. But we might discover a lot more about this object that might surprise us even more. It's a very exciting mission, um, and it's actually something that a lot of scientists are looking forward to because it will definitely help us understand the solar system and, of course, our own Earth a lot more. On that note, until we learn more, that's all I wanted to mention. Subscribe if you still haven't, share this video with someone who enjoys learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe even support this channel on Patreon. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.